This conference will now be recorded. All right, well, welcome everybody. Good to have you with us today. Let me open us up with a word of prayer and we will get right to our topic, our topics, I should say, starting with Barnabas and then moving on to Bethlehem, Colossae, Crete, and Damascus. So uh, looks like one person in four places. <laughs> All right, let's go to it. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for these students. We thank you for the blessings we have to study to show ourselves approved. And we ask for your blessing upon our study. And we thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, the first topic is very dear to me as we talk about Barnabas. Um, I've long been a Barnabas fan. Uh, for years, I held the view that Barnabas was the author, the human author of Hebrews. Um, I have recently changed that view. Um, having come to appreciate the Lucan hypothesis for the Lucan authorship of Hebrews, but be that as it may, um, still every study I've ever had on Barnabas has been a blessing, and I appreciate what? him, his uh, what's that? His ministry with the Apostle Paul. All right, did I hear somebody? I'm... All right, there we go. I've gone ahead and muted everybody. If you do have a question, feel free to uh, pop in the chat window or unmute yourself and, and ask your question. So uh, Barnabas, born in Cyprus and died in Salamis in the first century. His Jewish parents called him Joseph. And when he's introduced to us here in Acts 4.36, he's introduced as Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles. So it was the apostles who gave him that nickname translated to mean son of encouragement. Uh, the bar part is Aramaic for son and nabas um, in any event. That's what we have there. A nickname that the apostles gave him. Who owned a tract of land, sold it, brought it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And very noteworthy in the fact that uh, being in, in Cyprus means that it was beyond the reach for confiscation. And uh, so it was safe, his property was safe. But there were so many Christians losing their property in uh, Jerusalem and were having uh, property confiscated that uh, they were sharing. They were they were selling their goods and holding all things in common. And uh, that's not a, a global mandate for communism, but it does give us a pattern for how churches can function under totalitarian government when uh, when a church has to go underground and uh, survive, caring for one another as uh, as the case may be. So. Um, there's one item, a huge item of dispute. As far as your quiz questions go, uh, everything in green is, is a quiz question. Uh, so Joseph was his birth name and Barnabas means son of encouragement. Although Barnabas was not among the original 12, he is traditionally thought to have been among the 72. And uh, that's, that's a reference we get to in the Gospel of Luke, the 72 or the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out two by two. And there's a lot of legends about who they are and, and pretty much anybody of significance in the first century is alleged to have been included among the 70. Um, we can't prove that because we don't have a list of who the 70 actually were. But then this final sentence where it says, thus he is given the honorary title of apostle. And that just bugs me to death. I don't understand why. Uh, and so I don't know if this was uh, Warren's article. He borrowed this from somebody else. But um, he was not an honorary apostle. He was an apostle. And I just want to share um, a couple of items there related to his apostleship. Um, and this really comes into focus when you encounter folks who think that there were only 12 apostles and the replacement for Judas is actually, um, ah, okay, gotcha that the replacement for uh, Judas was Paul. They want Paul to be the 12th apostle. They want Paul to be uh, have his name on the 12 foundation stones of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so they reject any other apostles beyond the 12. And it's really unfortunate because that's not necessary to do. Um, but the scriptures are pretty clear. Let me move this over to this side. Here we go. And uh, I'll just start with Acts 14.4. The people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles. And uh, that's a term that's applied to Paul and, and Barnabas equally. And in verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, 
they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd crying out. So that's the God breathed and inspired word of God that calls Barnabas and Paul both apostles. Um, likewise, when the apostles sent Barnabas off to Antioch, they didn't just send him, they apostelloed him. They apostelloed Barnabas off to Antioch. And then finally, the logic of 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5 says, Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? And so this too, I think when you have this phrase, the rest of the apostles, <laughs> and then he says, do only Barnabas and I, are we exceptions to the rule? Um, that's a very clear defense of, of Barnabas's apostleship. All of this, by the way, is greatly relied upon by the folks who do depend, who do defend the Barnabas authorship of Hebrews, uh, because they uh, they really feel it increases his authorship likelihood if he's truly an apostle to uh, to author a New Testament book. Anyway, um, just wanted to share that with you. It's not a big deal, I guess, but. Um, it bugged me anyway to color it red. And uh, there you have it. All right. Barnabas was a tremendous man of grace. In fact, he beat Paul on the grace contest. He had more grace than Paul did. And when he realized that uh, that he needed more help in Antioch, then he went to Tarsus and fetched the Apostle Paul and brought him with him from Tarsus to Antioch. That's also a quiz question because uh, you got a true false question on there if Barnabas had ever gone to. Tarsus. Uh, he has a cousin or a nephew named John Mark, and he's referenced there. Uh, and, th and that was really the split between Barnabas and Paul. He was at Lystra in Laconia, where they were thought to be gods because of the miracles that they worked. So Barnabas was called Zeus, and Paul was called Hermes, the chief interpreter or the talker of the, of the group. Anyway, kind of a funny story uh, on that first missionary journey, but there you have it. And it is interesting. The other glimpse here I would see is not mentioned, but in Galatians chapter 2, when the Apostle Paul is having his grace showdown with uh, Peter, he says even Barnabas was caught up in the hypocrisy. And that's, uh, that's pretty extraordinary. So... Um, yeah, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. And when the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, and the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. And for Paul to use language like that, talking about even Barnabas, uh, I think that really testifies to a tremendous respect and admiration. And um, he was really speaking well of Barnabas at that point as being maybe the least likely legalist Paul had ever met. And yet even Barnabas got carried away in the legalism that Peter was uh, was promoting. Anyway, that's it. Uh, any questions on Barnabas? Um, there's some other things that, that we get into. Of course, there's some apocryphal works that don't belong in the Bible. The legendary gospel of Barnabas and several other traditions about uh, where he lived, his death, and so forth. Um, venerated in Florence, Italy. How about that? Something else you can do, by the way, I, may, I showed this in church this morning, that not only can you search for a name, but better than searching for a name is you can actually highlight Barnabas the person and do a, uh, a Bible church on Barnabas the person. And uh, that way, your search results come back with more than just the proper name Barnabas, you come back with Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas. And every reference that gets highlighted there is a reference to uh, to Barnabas. And that's a, a very useful search function. And I appreciate the the fact that our Bibles have been tagged to have those to have those references in there. But this way, you can spot very quickly that Barnabas is featured in Acts chapter four, Acts chapter nine. Chapter 11, 12, 13, 14. All those references, 15, the early part of the chapter. And then 1 Corinthians, Galatians, and Colossians.
are the final biblical references to Barnabas. All right, any other questions, anything related to Barnabas? All right. Wow, this could be a quick Sunday then. <laughs> um, move on to Bethlehem. A town, in, and it bugs me too that we're using Palestine as a geographic reference, but okay, here we go. Um, it was never really called Palestine until the Romans conquered it and drove the Jews out, and then they changed the name. Uh, they used, they, they referenced it as, in the Latin, they referenced it as Palestine, naming it after the ancient Philistine peoples, who by this point of time were long, long gone. Hey, Pastor Bob? I'm hearing something. Yes. Um, I was just curious, is it too much of a rabbit trail for a quick explanation of why you switched to Luke on Hebrews or? Ah, yeah, probably for today, but I would love to talk about that in the meantime. All right, we'll I'll get back to you. Yeah, 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 remind me about that. And maybe if we finish up today and we still have extra time, then we can go into that. Um, all right. Good question. Bethlehem, about five miles south of Jerusalem at an elevation of 2550 feet above mean sea level, overlooks the highway to Hebron and Egypt. So I was just talking about Palestine. I don't like the label Palestine, uh, but you know we're kind of stuck with it. It was um, the name that the Romans gave to it after they conquered uh, Jerusalem and, dis and dispersed the Jewish people. Um, but I guess, be that as it may. It's now it's such a political term these days with the the Arabs laying claim to a historical land of Palestine as if they are the the true heirs of the, the ancient Palestinians, which is insane. But this uh, lost world buys into the mythology and takes it from there. Uh, Bethlehem does mean house of bread and Lechem is bread and Beth is a house. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, most likely as a granary, as a location where grain could be stored, where, where bread was prepared. Uh, great, the great Christological prophecy related to this uh, in Micah 5.2, as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. So uh, when all the, the various clans were sorted and the, the larger clans were selected, as the uh, as the clans of Judah, Bethlehem was too small and not counted among among the clans. They still, of course, had a, a territory, and that territory uh, belonged to uh, the Ephrathah, the Ephrathah uh, family. Um, you can call it a clan if you'd like, but it was not big enough to be counted among the 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 primary clans of Judah there. Uh, but but uh, David's father Jesse is called the Ephrathite. He is the he is the clan uh, chieftain. He's the clan elder, clan leader uh, at the birth of Jesse, at the birth of David. So um, there's some other history that's connected there that we study when we're doing these kind of studies. Um, but there you have it. If you want to look at it on a map, again, right click it, select Bethlehem, the place. And then uh, you can pull it up in the atlas. And you'll see it right there. And Bethlehem shows up in a lot of different map books from uh, the patriarchal period and on into the, uh, uh, the conquest, the judges, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, the captivity, the return, the life of Jesus. You're going to have Bethlehem in uh, in all of those maps there. Anyway, this is a fun feature too. If you haven't explored this yet, if you haven't um, kind of played with the Atlas feature in your Logos Bible software, I encourage you just to spend some time and poke around and examine it. You can uh, zoom in on different things. You can turn on different labels, and uh, it's a pretty neat, pretty neat utility there. There were other towns named Bethlehem. It's kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's so generic as a name. I think there's more than just the two that are mentioned here. Most notably, there's one in the north, 
uh, in the, the Zebulun, the tribe of Zebulun. My suspicion is all 12 tribes probably had at least one Bethlehem, maybe multiple Bethlehems within their territory. Uh, but Bethlehem Ephrathah, that sets it apart, the clan of Ephrathah, Bethlehem of Judah, the city of David. And uh, it's where uh, Rachel was buried nearby there, her tomb. A lot of background on Bethlehem. Um, the only quiz question in the Bethlehem section is uh, the one I highlighted green there, five miles south of Jerusalem. Became part of the land allotted to Judah in Judges 17. This is where David was born. This is where uh, Samuel came to anoint him. David's three heroes brought him water from the well at Bethlehem. You can read that in 2 Samuel 23. And then, of course, Bethlehem, Judah was the birthplace of Jesus because they had to travel there for the census. Otherwise, uh, he would have been up in Nazareth. But uh, both have to be true, that he is called a Nazarene, but also that uh, um, Galilee of the Gentiles was prophesied and uh, Bethlehem was prophesied. So, and Egypt was prophesied. Out of Egypt, I will call my son. There were three geographic prophecies centered on the first advent of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's even more geographic prophecies related to the second advent of Jesus Christ. And uh, for anybody that uh, tries to see or thinks that there's contradictions, that uh, somehow Bethlehem and Galilee and Egypt cannot all be, um, they cannot all be true, um, better think again, because they all are true. That uh, the Galilee prophecy is true, the Bethlehem prophecy is true, and the Egypt prophecy is true. And uh, God is so marvelous that he can give these, these prophecies that might appear to be contradictory. And then when he fulfills every single one of them, uh, I think we ought to be just amazed and humbled and thankful that our father is so marvelous in all that he does. Um, something else, by the way, in addition to these studies on Bethlehem and Colossae and Damascus and so forth, um, I would just also recommend that when you come to a, a, a place like this, um, in uh, in Lagos again, you can right click it, and then the selection. I already mentioned Bethlehem of Judah as a place. That's what you want to highlight there, Bethlehem the place. And then instead of the atlas, you can also bring up the fact book. The fact book is a marvelous utility, and it's really been improved upon from Lagos eight to Lagos nine. And this fact book gives you a report that. Um, uh, just summarizes your Bible dictionaries, it points you to uh, different pictures, it points you to um, a lot of resources in your library, gives you a, a nice summary, similar to how the Grace Notes article is written, gives you a nice summary here. And again, there's photographs, different media that are a part of your library, key passages, the ways that it's referenced, including Bethlehem, City of Judah, Ephrathah, different labels that it has, Hebrew terms, Greek terms, events that took place there. Oh, by the way, it wasn't mentioned in the Grace Notes article, but the story of Boaz and Ruth. Boaz and Ruth take place there in, in Bethlehem. The timeline, your different Bible dictionaries. Anyway, I, I encourage this, more topics, places nearby. This is a great report. And, um, and it's available for almost every proper noun in the Bible. When you right click it, um, you can bring up the, the fact book for that word. So just to highlight on that, if you haven't found the, the fact book yet in your Bible software, I encourage you. And um, there's a, uh, a button you can toggle on and off here on your toolbar. And this creates a visual filter for everything that is in the fact book. It'll underline it for you. So um, that kind of lets you know at a glance uh, what words, what terms, what things in your Bible text are available for, um, for fact book articles. But it's the bulk of every word in your Bible, I'll tell you that. All right. So that's a short paragraph or a short article any questions on bethlehem no questions 
hearing some feedback, microphone feedback. All right. Okay. Well, then we'll go on to Colossae. And this is fun too, because of course, we just spent two years in the book of Colossians and we've done uh, Colossae background studies. And so this uh, is good to us. One thing I have to dispute is that Revelation does not refer to Colossae. Revelation refers to the neighboring town of Laodicea. Um, so that's kind of a, a surprising reference there. Um, all right, good. Um, Geographical information there, Lycus River and Phrygia. Um, of course, the region changed from era to era as far as who uh, had dominance there. An important, uh, according to Herodotus and Xenophon, actually had faded in significance by the New Testament or not long after the New Testament era. Uh, Cyrus the Younger passed through it in 401 BC. So by the time we get to the first century, there's no question Laodicea was a more prominent city. Paul never visited Colossae in person, and I agree with that. I think that's the, the best understanding of Colossians, um, Colossians 2 specifically. Colossians 2, 1, where it says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. And so I think that the plain sense of that verse is that he had never been to Laodicea, never been to Colossae, and that most of the believers he was writing to in uh, the book of Colossians are uh, believers that he had never met face to face. Um, likely it was due to Epaphras. I think Epaphras was their first teacher. And uh, maybe Timothy also had a role. Um, as far as Colossians 1, um, I think verse 17 is a typo. It should be verse 7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. So it appears that all of the doctrine that Colossae received as a young church, they got founded and grounded by uh, the ministry of Epaphras there. And that uh, seems to be the, the case. And I think after Epaphras departed, then uh, Archippus becomes their new pastor. And that's also hinted at in Colossians 4 and in uh, Philemon that uh, Archippus is now the second pastor of this church in Colossae. Um, the location of the home of Philemon, Epaphras was the pastor, the original pastor, not the current pastor for the book of Philemon. Um, documentation in Colossians 4, and then, yeah, you've got to dispute. These, re these references in Revelation are not to Colossae, they are to Laodicea. Colossae is not one of the seven churches of Revelation, which is kind of sad, actually, because you, you'd have to wonder uh, either was it no longer a church? Was it no longer in existence by John uh, by that time? You know, from the from the 50s to the 90s, 40 years have gone by in between Colossians and Revelation. Uh, maybe the lampstand is not there anymore. Or or I think much more likely that uh, Colossian, uh, the church at Colossae was an independent uh, post-apostolic church and the seven that are written are the last seven churches to be under um, apostolic authority. John is the last living apostle and these seven churches are the final seven churches under apostolic authority. That Colossae and, and everywhere else uh, was now an independent church under a pastor teacher in the post-apostolic era. That's my suspicion anyway. Um, the home to many Jews, industry uh, revolved around uh, what's called here colosinus, a type of wool which was purple in color, actually got dyed purple uh, thanks to Thyatira and some of the uh, purple dyes that were available in this province. Uh, religious tend was Gnosticism, some of the warnings that come up in Colossians 2 about um, the worship of angels and other issues there. Probably um, not true Gnosticism, because it's still a century too early for that, but no question it was prototype Gnosticism, attitudes that eventually became Gnosticism in, uh, in the second century. Some information here to the seventh and eighth centuries, of course, got overrun by Muslims and uh, so forth. The archeology span is interesting. It really has not been uh, excavated. Uh, it's kind of just sitting there begging for further investigations because uh, 
it has not been greatly excavated and it's available for excavation. In other words, there's not a modern city really sitting on top of the uh, the ancient city. So it's just begging to have further excavations done. All right, and then Phrygia, called Asia Minor by the Romans. And then they moved the, the uh, administration lines from time to time trying to separate their Phrygians from their Galatians. <laughs> you know, um, we think that the issues we have today in the modern world are difficult. It's always been the case. And uh, the Romans would come in and conquer a bunch of people and then they try to draw these lines and then they find out they, they have to move them and readjust them because because uh, the Phrygians or the Phrygians don't get along well with the, the Galatians and and whatnot. And sometimes they just overlook it and they uh, they don't care they just draw lines on a map for roman purposes and doesn't bother them at all that uh, they're they're dividing ethnic uh, ethnic tribal groups uh, on different sides of a boundary so uh, anyway it's sad when uh that happens of course we've got our own history of doing that and europe uh, had you know that's how the map of africa looks like it does to this day because uh, europeans drew lines on a map same thing with uh south asia and other places all right any questions on colossi all right and then we move on to crete this is going very quickly colossi crete and damascus all right and of course um even if you don't have a Bible uh, Bible verse to click, you can always open your fact book and just start typing Crete. And uh, these are all your options for fact books related to Crete. We'll just take the top one there, Crete the island. This gives you your information similar to the Grace Notes article. Plus you got your maps. All right. And this is useful too, because I don't know about you, but I'm kind of dyslexic or retarded. I'm constantly mixing up Crete with Cyprus. <laughs> so it's alphabetical, left to right. Crete is on the left, Cyprus is on the right. And uh, maybe that'll help you remember, I don't know. But I'm constantly looking this up. All right, zoom in on Crete, where these Cretan liars are. All right. Forms the southern boundary to the Aegean Sea, lies southeast of Greece, 156 miles long, 7 to 35 miles wide, over 3,000 square miles in area, the fifth largest island of the Mediterranean. Well, there you go. Um, on the spine of an undersea mountain range. Uh, likely, yes, I think it's likely the Philistines came from uh, Crete. It's also likely that they came from Cyprus, so that gets debated. Um, as far as the origin of the Sea Peoples and uh, the uh, original um, Sea People invaders into um, into Israel and into Egypt, the uh, history is a little murky, and, and uh, even with the translation of Linear B, they're still working to translate Linear A. Uh, Sir Arthur Evans did much of the early archaeological works here, and I uh, enjoyed reading about this. Um, just kind of paid his own way and did his own research. Arrived at the harbor at Knossos in that year, began an archaeological dig at the nearby Kefala site. And on day one is when he discovered this Bronze Age palace. So <laughs> one of the remarkable uh, archaeological uh, issues here. And I think this is the only quiz question related to Crete as well, which is Nice to get that out of the way. Um, you can read through the rest of this, and hopefully you already have. Of course, the story of the Minotaur and the King Minos. Um, even the language itself, this the discovery of Linear A and Linear B, uh, deciphering uh, the Linear B script. Um, in fact, this was very hotly debated at the time, and uh, some of the Greek scholars that uh, 
thought it was Phoenician and then other scholars thought it was Greek and then they argued back and forth. And now uh, there's really some discussion too related to the alphabet itself, the, the Phoenician alphabet and the Greek alphabet both coming from a, a common source. Um, there's more to probably want to explore related to those things. Likewise, um, the, uh, the ancient Hebrew text. All right. The Minoan civilization was destroyed by an earthquake or by a volcano. 1400 BC eruption of the Santorini volcano on a nearby island, not even on the same island, the island of Thera, about 70 miles north of Crete. So there you go. There were Cretan Jews in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Cretans and Arabs, and uh, Paul did stop on his way to Rome. Cretans are liars. Let's see, there were other, yeah, descriptions of them. Most of them are not favorable descriptions. Sordid love of gain and lust for wealth prevail among them. Cretans are the only people in the world whose eyes no gain is disgraceful. <laughs> Owing to their ingrained lust of wealth, they're involved in constant broils, public and private, in murders and civil wars. Well, there you go. So Spartans don't think very highly of them. Polybius. Yeah. Such are the points in which I consider these two political systems to differ, and I will now give my reasons for not regarding that of Crete as worthy of praise or imitation. So yeah, chalk up Polybius as not being a multiculturalist, okay? <laughs> of course, the, uh, the philosophy of our day and age is that every culture is equally valid and valuable, and we should uh, uphold every culture. Um, you know, the I think the more normal view is that every uh there's there's pluses and minuses of every culture and uh, some are better than others and uh, of course the greeks viewed theirs as the pinnacle and everybody else were barbarians um but that's uh that's the nature of humanity some of these things did interest me though in my opinion there are two fundamental things in every state by virtue of which its principles and constitution are either desirable or the reverse. I mean, customs and laws, what is desirable in these makes men's private lives righteous and well-ordered and the general character of the state gentle and just. What is to be avoided has the opposite effect. And um, I don't know, we have the same, I think this is a, a stoicheia, an elemental principle of the cosmos. I think it is a, a worldview um, issue that Satan promotes that if we just have the right kind of government with uh, customs and laws then that are um, the best uh, that we can create, then men's private lives are gonna be in good shape, uh, righteous and well-ordered. If, if all we had was just the, the, uh, the best kind of government and then uh, the general character of the state would be gentle and just. And uh, of course, the biblical view is that we're all sinners and uh, a private life to be righteous and well-ordered has to be adjusted to the word of God, not, not uh, governed by a, a political organization. But anyway, we're still living in dreamland, dreamland today that government's gonna be our savior. Uh, I probably better get off that uh, side trip. Treachery of some of these citizens. So how many times do you have to be lied to before you just write people off as being treacherous and all Cretans are liars? And then the story of the capture of Achaeus, a true and truly Cretan episode. <laughs> okay, there's no quiz questions on this section and uh, it's kind of fun to read. Ah, yes, once, I agree. If I'm lied to once, then uh, then I then I identify who the liar is, and I'm very skeptical of anything they have to say. They've already demonstrated that they've lied to me in the past, 
So now I've got to be uh, cautious related to anything they say in the future. All right. Well, I'm not going to go through all of this. Hopefully you read it and you either liked it or you didn't. I, I eat this stuff up. But we got to deal with Damascus. It's our last topic and our last quiz question. Damascus is the capital of Syria. Uh, one of the oldest cities in the world, if not the oldest city in the world. There's other places that try to make a claim to it. But clearly, uh, it's around in 2000 BC when Abraham's talking about a fellow here named Eliezer. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, likely uh, a slave, likely Eliezer was a slave that Abraham obtained and then adopted to make him his heir until uh, the birth of physical sons. Um, he was a trusted servant who I think was then dispatched. We don't know that it was Eliezer by name, but it was Abraham's servant that was sent to find a, a bride for Isaac. Uh, but the fact that Damascus is mentioned here makes it uh, very old in the patriarchal era in the early centuries after the flood. Again, you can select Damascus as a place. You can uh, bring it up in the atlas or bring it up in the fact book or both. Because from the fact book, you can get to the atlas. And uh, from the atlas, you can uh, open the fact book right there. So they go well hand in hand. But northeast of Israel and um, still to this day, um, a thorn in the side of the Jewish people because it's the capital of a, of a very hostile nation that uh, presently conducts terrorist, uh, terrorist operations against the Jewish people. That's why Israel seized the Golan Heights, by the way, this, this uh, ridge of, of higher elevation right here, that whoever's sitting on this ridge of higher elevation here has the advantage uh, over the lower lands to the northeast or the lower lands to the southwest. So uh, for, for Israel, having uh, Syria sit on top of this ridge uh, was just deadly uh, for shelling and, and other attacks on Israel. So they took it. They took it away and uh, during the Six-Day War, and they kept it. And now, uh, in fact, now it's not going to be on this map. But if you zoom in on a modern map of, uh, of Israel, there is, a, there is a Trump village here that they named after our our former president. So I find that interesting. All right. Um, as far as the rest of this history goes, you got this good article here uh, in the Grace Notes material. All the other references we have to Damascus in Genesis and 1 Kings, um, where Naaman came from, Elisha Gehazi, that story there you might remember. All right. Yeah, there's a lot of good material in here. And then um, I had thought there were going to be more uh, quiz questions from this section, but there really weren't. Glenn Carnegie wrote a thing on uh, this is Glenn Sr. Wrote up an article on Damascus. All right. During the time of David, the Aramean kingdom. And this had really become a thorn before they got conquered by the Assyrians. Um, they teamed up with the northern kingdom to attack the southern kingdom. They had some, uh, some alliances that went back and forth. I like Hadad and Ben Hadad in the uh, Old Testament. All right. Well, it is interesting, though, that when this king was invading, we have the background then. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, or Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, uh, the son of Ramaliah, against Judah. So now we've got this alliance, they're teaming up. And uh, how sad is it when, when one Jewish kingdom is attacking another Jewish kingdom and they, uh, they partner up with Gentiles to come attack their fellow Jews 
and just a, a very sad, ugly time. And then, uh, so you have the reign of, of uh, Ahaz here, mentioned in uh, First King, uh, Second Kings 15 and Second Kings 16. And um, 20 years old when he becomes king, he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God as his father David had done. I've got him flagged here as a red. Um, I'm trying to put flags on all the kings of Judah to mark them as good kings or bad kings. And uh, it's another project I'm working on. So yeah, he's a bad king there. Got the red flag by his name. And uh, he even sacrificed his son, made his son pass through the fire. What an abomination for any parent to do that. But uh, potentially, any son of Ahaz is in the line of Christ. and <laughs> could be, you know, here, what's he doing when he's sacrificing uh, his, his children to Molech? How sad is that? But this is the context then, this rascal here named Ahaz, when um, the prophet Isaiah comes to him and asks, you know, invites him to ask for a sign. Ask yourself a sign from the Lord. Make it as deep as shale or as high as heaven. And then Ahaz acts like he's too good for that or he's too holy for that. And uh, says, oh, no, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And uh, so Isaiah says, all right, you're going to get a sign anyway. And this is where he receives the, the message of the, uh, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Anyway, connections there. I just got a uh, chat message popping up. Let me check this real quick. Oh, talking about Palestine as a geographic label. Yes. In fact, Jews that lived there were called Palestinians. And uh, the Jewish Brigade in the British Army was called the Palestinian Brigade. That's right. And the first Jewish newspaper there was called the Palestinian Post. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Jews were the, uh, the uh, Palestinians during the Mandate period. Arabs of the region were allies of the Axis. Oh, yeah, they were horrible. The Transjordan uh, Arab tribes. All right. Thank you for that. Of course, the um, when Alexander conquered and uh, and then died, and his kingdom was divided into the four parts. Uh, one of those parts was Syria, and uh, it was Antiochus and Seleucus. That uh, Seleucus was the first, and then his son Antiochus. All of these kings of uh, of Syria and the Greek era of Damascus featured in uh, the book of Daniel and uh, the Maccabean stories in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Good history there. Then under Roman rule, it says under Roman rule, its history is obscure. Yes and no. Um, really, it was, a, it was a Roman capital and the province of Syria was was the dominant province uh, so much so that um, that uh, most of the the Roman governance came through uh, Damascus came through Syria and then Israel was administered secondarily either as a secondary kingdom under Herod or under a, a governor like Pontius Pilate um, the Syrian province of, of Rome uh, was actually fairly well developed and I'm curious why the author here calls uh, calls this obscure. There was a point, of course, that the Nabataeans did um, gain control there. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm getting text messages and I'm going to ignore those because I'm teaching a class. All right. One of them is a missionary, though. I want to return that as soon as class is over. All right. Um, but I would recommend, too, uh, studying the Nabataeans. I don't know that the Nabataeans um, are featured in any Grace Notes curriculum or not, uh, but, but they are a people group that's well worth being exposed to uh, as it spans, it bridges Old Testament to New Testament and then on beyond New Testament times uh, when Paul was visiting Damascus and let down the window. Um, Anyway, there's Eratus, the king of the Nabataeans, and good history connected to that. Also, it really forms the Nabataean Arabic. The Nabataean Arabic is, uh, I think, is vital to, um, do I have a book suggestion? Uh, I'd have to think about that. 
Um, but some of the uh, the text criticism work that's being done presently in modern times related to the Quran is actually devastating to any of the, the Islamic mythology related to the uh, Muhammad was allegedly of the Qureshi uh, tribe. And um, much of the Quran is so unintelligible anyway uh, by trying to uh, force it into a South Arabian uh, context. Um, but there's actually great value in seeing the Northern Arabian context and seeing the actual um, Nabataean Arabic dialect as uh, of, by the way, Abataean Aramaic, uh, the, the Aramaic dialect of the Nabataeans uh, really is helpful in trying to uh, unravel some of the Quran's puzzles that are there. So anyway, it's not that the Muslims will ever admit to it, but at least um, independent scholarship is now very uh, dubious of uh, Mecca as having anything to do with anything uh, related to Islam in the in the seventh century. So uh, anyway, stay tuned for that. I look forward to doing it. I'll, I'll come up with some book suggestions when I, um, but just to start with, Robert Spencer, uh, did Muhammad exist? I would say start with that. And then from there, you can branch out into some of these Nabataean studies. Anyway, that's how I'm approaching it in my uh, Islam skepticism. Oh, here's more quiz questions. Yeah, during the Christian era, it played a minor role in its history. Really, though, the street called Straight is mentioned in the book of Acts, where Paul went and uh, where he entered into the, the home there when he was blinded. And, um, and then uh, it's been found. Archaeology has discovered the street called Straight. Uh, passed out of Christian control by the Arabs in 634 AD. It's been a Muslim city ever since. Damascus has been a Muslim city ever since. That is a quiz question as well. All right, well. Um, that's, the, that's the end of the material, goodness. Uh, Barnabas, Bethlehem, Colossae, Crete, Damascus. Quick and easy. Any final questions? I think this is a record for us. Any uh, additional questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Looks like we're up to 14 students now. Judy Snyder is with us. Larry Stevens is with us. These are some names I didn't see. Rudy's joined us. Welcome, everybody. Well, um, then we do have time. <laughs> if, if I can take uh, Wes's question, if nobody else has other questions. Uh, so in discussing Barnabas, like I had said earlier, for years and years, I was always, um, uh, I had been a Barnabas proponent. Um, I've never, never felt that, that Paul was a likely author because there's just so many differences between all of the Pauline epistles that we do have and so many differences with, with, with Hebrews. I was very clear that the author of Hebrews is connected to Paul, was a traveling companion of Paul, was influenced by Paul's ministry and theology. But uh, I've been convinced for, for a long, long time that Paul could not have been the author of Hebrews. And, um, but then, let me find it. You asked about a book. The uh, Lucan Authorship of Hebrews by David Allen. This is a uh, part of the New American Commentary Studies in Bible and Theology. This is uh, a library of about a dozen books here, 11 books in the collection that provide excellent uh, supplementary studies pertaining to the New Testament. And uh, that book on the Lucan authorship of Hebrews, I think I've read it now four times through cover to cover, um, just absolutely link, uh, makes the case for Luke, um, dispels the mythology that Luke was a Gentile, um, uh, demonstrates uh, from the book of Luke and the book of Acts uh, how not only was Luke very clearly Jewish, but most likely was uh, in the uh, was a Levite, was a was a or possibly even of the of the priestly uh, clans. And so um, anyway, David Allen Black is a good author. I think it was David Black. 
No, David L. Allen. Got to be careful. There's a different author named David Allen Black. David L. Allen. He also, by the way, wrote a marvelous commentary on the book of Hebrews itself, a Hebrews commentary in the New American Commentary Collection. So um, excellent, dispensational, conservative, careful, uh, comprehensive scholar. I think uh, the language is a very polished Greek, very similar. The only thing that approaches it in the New Testament is Luke and Acts, <laughs> uh, very uh, almost Alexandrian uh, classical Greek compared to the rest of the New Testament. There are so many affinities with, uh, with Luke and Acts, far more than with Paul. And the affinities with Paul, just in terms of vocabulary and work usage, uh, word usage, the affinities with Paul come primarily in the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And that the interesting case there is that um, Luke was most likely the amanuensis for the pastoral epistles. So any vocabulary adjustments that set the pastoral epistles off as being slightly different from the rest of the Pauline corpus um, can be explained by Luke's participation as a scribe and also provides a tremendous affinity with, with uh, the book of Hebrews. So um, getting some more comments here. Yes, David L. Allen and, oh, available on Kindle for 10 bucks. There you go. So I do recommend it. And there's more studies I think that go into it. The use of um, medical vocabulary, uh, the fact, um, I hate to say this, but Pastor Theme's favorite verse, Hebrews 4.12, this sharp two-edged sword, um, if, you, if, if you're militaristic, if the author of this text is militaristic and this book is saturated with um, armaments and weapons and terms like that, then um, I would have any problem translating the Machaira as a sharp two-edged sword. However, if the book is filled with medical terminology, and we find, which it is, we find that there are a lot of medical terms and expressions that a doctor might use, then um, two-edged sword is not the translation we should go with, that the Machairas could just as easily be a surgeon uh, knife or a surgeon scalpel. And in fact, in this very verse, uh, the sharp two-edged uh, surgical scalpel, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, uh, so you almost are seeing an autopsy being performed here with a surgeon's scalpel that is uh, piercing to the to the depths of the body, and uh, which makes for an interesting consideration just vocabulary-wise related to uh, the fact that when you survey the whole um, all 13 chapters of Hebrews uh, and ask yourself, is this does this lean medical or does this lean military? It's not even close. It, it leans medical in uh, in so many ways. And David Allen uh, spotlights that quite well in, uh, in his text. All right, so that was um, Wes's question related to, yes, I think the authorship of, of uh, Acts is, uh, is Luke. What I'm, what I'm hoping to do next, by the way, there is a great tool in the um, Logos software. I'm hoping to get Logos to give us some flexibility, but in the uh, Bible Books Explorer, if I bring this up here, all right, if you can see this, The name of the 11 book series is called the NAC Studies in Bible and Theology. NAC Studies in Bible and Theology. And this is, it's an 11 volume series. It's intended to be a supplement and it's a very colorful, I'll give them that. They've got very colorful um, covers, uh, but some marvelous ones, including Future Israel, uh, Believer's Baptism, the uh, the Ten Commandments, Messianic Hope, or by Rydelnik, this is great, on the Messianic Hope, the Lord's Supper, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, just a marvelous text. I, I have yet to be disappointed on, uh, on any of those volumes. All right, what I'm showing you on the screen now, this is called the Bible Books Explorer, 
And um, this is kind of a neat utility. And right now we're looking at, at everything. If we just want to zoom in on the New Testament, we can filter it like so. And then we have our New Testament from Matthew to Revelation listed in order. Um, we can change that, by the way, if we want to structure it by how long are these books. Um, sort of that way. Luke is the longest. It has the most words. 19,446 words in the Gospel of Luke. And then Acts, 18,412 words. So if you're just counting words and, and, and envisioning the length of the New Testament, Luke and Acts are right there, the top two. And then uh, Matthew, John, Mark, and Revelation following. We say Mark is the smallest of the Gospels, but still any of the Gospels is going to be huge compared to a Pauline epistle or any of the other books of the New Testament. Uh, Romans and 1 Corinthians are the longest of Paul's epistles, and it just kind of, and then Hebrews after that. And then everything gets significantly shorter. Um, you can also sort by author. So when I, I can select the Pauline corpus, or I can select uh, what I want to do, there's the Johannine literature, the Gospel of John, three epistles of John. And but the problem here is, is that it's excluding Revelation, and we need to uh, we need to uh, to fix that. Um, and likewise with Luke as the author. Luke. Right now it only lists Luke and Acts. I would love to be able to list Hebrews there and to have the flexibility to do that. Anyway, if you have not yet found your Bible Books Explorer, I encourage you to look for that. It is in your Logos Bible software. And uh, you'll have some fun exploring that. All right, let me, uh, if there's no additional questions, let me, uh, I can close in prayer and uh, we can turn your cameras back on. Are there any more issues here next week in, in Doctrine 403, we're gonna move on to Dispensations, Edomites, Enoch, Ephesus, and Essenes. And uh, this top one is one that's near and dear to me, so we can spend all 90 minutes just on that one by itself. Um, and probably we'll spend the bulk of our time there. Of course, Enoch we saw recently in the Genesis class. Which package of the Logos software are these features found? I'll have to check on that because, um, yeah, the Bible Books Explorer, let me pull that up again under Tools. Bible Books Explorer. This is the about information. All right. Oh, and I got a share. Let me change my share. Okay, the title is included in silver, silver and up, silver feature upgrade, Logos 9 academic feature upgrade, silver feature upgrade, or full feature upgrade. Yeah, give, and uh, just give Logos a call. I'll be happy to unlock that for you and, uh, and provide for that. Ah, okay. Valerie says, if you're running anything before Windows 10, you will not be able to access any of these tools unless you are running it via the web. Um, you know, I'm not sure because there's also a Mac version of Logos that has all of these tools as well. Robbie Dean uses the Mac version of Logos and he has these, uh, these different utilities, the Atlas, the Factbook, the uh, Bible Books Explorer, so many of these uh, plugins. <laughs> you know, I'm not running a Mac either. All right. I try to be gracious towards the Apple people. I know they're out there. 
All right, well, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these students. Thank you for this study. Continue to bless these studies as we move forward. Father, we've got eight more to go here in Doctrine 400. Um, pray for diligence, especially next week in Doctrine 403, going through dispensations. That is such a critical study. And uh, confusion on that just creates more trouble than uh, than we can uh, imagine. So uh, keep us solid, keep us grounded. And, uh, and mostly, Father, just keep us reading with discernment so that we can search the scriptures and see if these things are so. I thank you and I praise you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to turn off the recording.